Good evening, church family. You may be seated. You may be seated. How y'all feeling tonight? You feeling good? You excited to be in the house of God on a Tuesday night? Let's go. Uh, it is so fun to be with you guys. Can we first give honor where honor is due to our lead pastors, Pastor Dave and Sarah. Thank you so much for being incredible, incredible lead pastors. We love you guys. Thank you for just leading the way in humility and generosity and setting the example for us around this state. And so Kylie and I are honored to be here tonight with you guys. Uh, as Pastor Dave said, um, I'm joined with my wife, Kylie, and uh, we will have been married uh, of one year in 16 days. So can we just praise God? Uh, pretty excited about that. She is the sweetest soul in the world, uh, but she knows how to throw down and put me in my place. How many of you guys know it's a good thing? And so uh, she's got that strong backbone. And she's from Tennessee, so please pray for her as we're entering back into the winter months. She had it easy this past winter, and so she's not quite ready for what is coming, I don't believe. Um, but, yeah, as Pastor Dave said, um, I'm now a traveling evangelist. And it's funny because the more I'm traveling as an evangelist, I'm starting to realize I may need to come up with a different title or a term that I share with people. I was in the gym a while back, and the guy goes, oh, yeah, you're an atheist, aren't you? And I was like, an atheist? He's like, yeah, yeah, you talk about that Jesus guy. I was like, an evangelist? I was like, that's kind of on the opposite spectrum you know what I'm saying, but uh, it has been the most supernatural years of my life. Uh, now been on the road for two and a half years full time, traveling across the country, met my wife through this opportunity, but as Pastor Dave said, I was a youth pastor in Rochester, Minnesota for six years. And I remember it was uh, January of 2021, I was driving my car home from work and I felt like the Holy Spirit just whispered in my ear, he said, you'll be gone by the end of the year. And I was like, excuse me? I was like, where am I going to go? And he's like, are you willing to do something you've never done so you can see something you've never seen? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> I have it pretty good here, God. Like, it's pretty comfortable. I have an incredible student ministry that I love, an incredible church family, incredible leadership. And uh, how many of you guys know, though, when God says it, you will see it. And God literally supernaturally wrestled me to the ground for 12 months. And in January of 2022, we launched uh, the nonprofit ministry. I've been traveling the country ever since. And so it has been the best season of my life. And God has done more than I could have ever imagined. And so um, tonight, I am excited to get into the word. Y'all ready for the word? Um, can I step on some toes? Is that okay? Like, can I get in your face tonight? Can we, can we have church? Um, I want to preach from the book of John. Y'all got your Bibles tonight? John, oh, two people. Let's go. Come on. John chapter 4, there's going to be a big Bible behind me. It says this. Now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left for Judea and departed again for Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. Would you do me a favor? Would you turn to the person next to you, look him square in the eyes and say, Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar near the field that Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from the journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. Next slide. A woman from Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. And the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews had no dealings with Samaritan. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Water, And I'd almost imagine this woman at this moment was probably so perplexed and intrigued. So she looks right back at him and says, okay, uh, sir, <laughs> you really don't have anything to draw water with. Next slide. And the well is very deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. And Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. Come on, son, buddy. But whoever drinks of the water that I give them will never thirst again. The water that I give will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And the woman said to him, sir, give me this water so I never have to come back here again. And Jesus said to her, go, 
call your husband and come here. And the woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said, you are right in saying you have no husband. For you've had five husbands. Someone say, "Uh uh-oh. And the woman, and the one you are with is not your husband. What you have said is true. And the woman said to him, sir, I perceive you to be a prophet. I want to pray, and then we're going to dig into this text. Y'all ready? Jesus, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for tonight. I pray by the power of your spirit, you would do exceedingly abundantly more than we could ask, think, or imagine in this beautiful church in Austin, Minnesota. In Jesus' name. Everybody said amen, amen, amen. amen. Uh, To start off tonight, are you cool if I just be really transparent with you? Like, can I bear my heart to you? Can we have, like, group therapy? Is that cool? Um, I need to confess something. I have an unhealthy obsession, and I would say borderline addiction, to Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. Praise God. God, Hallelujah. Okay. Now, I want to say something controversial. This may really make some of y'all upset with me. I don't love just the, 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 the milk chocolate. I love the white chocolate. Y'all, that is just devastating, okay? The white chocolate Reese's are just another level of heaven. Um, How many of you guys remember the year 2020? Pretty hard to forget, right? Um, I remember 2020 uh, pretty vividly. It was interesting. And isn't it interesting how 2020 didn't necessarily create a lot of our dysfunctional habits. It really just exposed a lot of our dysfunctional habits. There's another sermon in that thought right there. But I remember I was quarantining with my lead pastor at the time because they said to slow the curves. We're watching a movie in his home, in his basement, and we got in the really bad habit of eating candy Every single night. Now, I ended up spending almost every single night with my pastor watching movies, going through every single trilogy from all the Marvel movies to all the Star Wars. And we just went through everything. And I had this horrible idea to pick up a large bag of Reese's peanut butter cups. Now, y'all think I'm talking about the two pack. No, no, no. I'm talking about that Halloween family pack that you hand out to all the kids that come trick or treating like 30 Reese's in this thing. I ate every single peanut butter cup in that bag every single night. Y'all, I gained 10 pounds in two weeks. It was unreal. I remember there was a moment that my pastor looked at me with a pile of Reese's wrappers, and he looks at me and goes, you have a problem. (laughs) How many are grateful for the people around you (laughs) that bring to light the patterns within you that you're unaware of? I remember there was a moment that I had a reflection, and I was like, okay, maybe I do eat a lot of Reese's. So starting in 2021, I was like, you know what? I'm going to go on this super strict diet. I'm going to be really healthy. I'm going to eat really clean. And I decided to cut out all the delicious cheeseburgers with bacon and fries, and I decided to substitute with salads. You know what I'm saying? Like the good stuff. But who would have thought that, no joke, you feel better when you eat clean? Like, I never in my life would have imagined that, okay? Here we are. You can ask my wife this. I am a all-or-nothing type personality person. So I, when I'm in on something, I'm all in. I don't, like, have Z this thing. And so I was so strict with myself, I was actually dying because I would never let myself have any type of cheeseburger or even just regular sandwich. It was always just healthy foods, healthy foods. And I was like, you know what? For my own sanity and probably for the sanity of people around me, I'm going to create something universal called the cheat day. How many of y'all have ever heard of a cheat day? Okay, a cheat day, let me talk to you about one of my cheat days. A cheat day looked like this for me. Can I just share what I ate in one day? Okay, y'all ready for this? Uh, I had four bacon cheeseburgers from Shake Shack up in Minneapolis. Y'all judging me already. Okay, this is not a safe space. Just kidding. Four bacon cheeseburgers and a fry on the side. Okay, headed home after my lunch meeting and I was like, you know what? It's a cheat day. I'm going to stop over at a local gluten-free bakery and get myself a slice of carrot cake. Praise God. Hallelujah. Stuff that thing down. That night, I had one of my friends invite me over to dinner. They wanted to hear about the ministry and all the things that God was doing in the traveling. And so his wife served mashed potatoes and meatballs. Y'all, I had to pray against temptation because I had nine plates of mashed potatoes and meatballs. Like, I just, it was so good. So good. I just kept eating, kept eating. And on my way home, I was like, okay, you know what? It's a cheat day. So I stop over at the local Target. I pick myself up some Reese's 
uh, I'm sorry, not Reese's, peanut butter M&M's and some gluten-free Oreos. Y'all don't hate on the gluten-free Oreos. Those things slap. They're very good. And I ate every single Oreo in that bag, and I ate every single peanut butter M&M. I was so full, I could not sleep on my stomach that night. You know, y'all are like, that's crazy. But how many guys know just because it looks good to you doesn't mean it's good for you? One of the things I've learned in my journey of following Jesus is that just because it looks good, just because it sounds good, just because it feels good, doesn't mean it's God. Because there's some things that can satisfy your soul and starve your spirit. There's some things that can fill you for a moment but leave you totally void of meaning. And I wonder how many people came into Cornerstone Church tonight constantly going back to the very thing that you know won't satisfy you. I wonder how many of us have come in here tonight constantly going back to the very thing in our life that we know won't satisfy satisfy our life. See, I'm not talking about the food that you and I eat. I'm talking about the faith that you and I walk out. I'm talking about the things that you've tried to move past, but you keep going back to. I'm talking about the things that you've tried to let go of, but you keep holding on to. I'm not talking about the things that you have control over. I'm talking about the things that have control over you. Come on, I know I'm not the only one that seems to say the very thing I told myself I would never say. I know I'm not the only one that seems to do the very thing that I told myself I would never do. If so many of us are saved, why are so many of us still stuck? Like, can we just be real? If so many of us are saved, why are so many of us still struggling? If God has come to give us life and life to the full, why are so many of us so empty? Why are so many of us so broken? It's like we're Christian, but we're crippled. Crippled by the same insecurities. Crippled by the same addictions. Crippled by the same problems that we've been with for years. And see, I believe it's imperative for us as the church of Jesus Christ. How many of you know we are the church? If you've put your faith in Jesus, you are the church. The church is not a building. The church is not a place. The church is a people. And I believe it's imperative that the church of Jesus Christ does not avoid the very things that we are called to address. But I believe it's imperative for us as the church to stand up boldly, to stand up delicately, to stand up with wisdom. And if you and I are going to do what God's called us to do, and if you and I are going to be who God has called us to be, then we cannot avoid the very spaces and the very places that God has anointed his people to step into. Because hear me, church family, you and I will never change what we're unwilling to confront. You and I will never change what we are not willing to face. And we have so many people who want to talk about the new life in Christ, but they want to tolerate the old lifestyle that they need to kill. So they're walking with new purpose, but they're limping with old patterns. And I don't know about you guys, but I think Christians have gotten into a really bad habit of really only ever addressing the surface issue and never really talking about the soul issue. So we go around people and we're like, stop saying that. Stop doing that. Stop entertaining that. But we never really get beneath the surface and get to the soul issue. Because the soul issue is the need, the belief, and the desire or the wound in our lives that we've left unresolved and unmet that keeps driving us back to the very thing that we know is contrary to the purpose and the person that God is making you into in your life. And here's the deal, whether you're finding yourself here tonight constantly going back to the very thing that you know won't satisfy, constantly going back to the very thing that you know isn't good for you, that you know won't fill you up, I want you to hear something. You're in good company. You're not alone. It doesn't mean you're a lesser Christian. It doesn't mean you don't love Jesus. It means you're human. Because whether every single one of us want to admit it, we've all felt it, we've all experienced, but here's what I've learned. If I do not first address it, I'll never stop going back to it. And I love that the text says that Jesus had to go through Samaria. Because the truth is, we all have some area in our life we need Jesus to show up in. We all have some area in our life that we need Jesus to step into. We all have some areas of our life that we've let run rampant. And if you and I are going to become who God has called us to become, 
And if you and I are going to do what God has called and created to do, it may require you to address some things, to look at some areas in your life and say, enough is enough. With God's spirit, with God's power, I'm going to step into my purpose. I'm going to walk in God's power. I'm not going to live crippled any longer. Come on. We don't need any more unbelieving believers. We need some believing believers that would step up and say, with God's spirit, with God's power for God's purpose, I will face this thing. My generation's compromise will not become the next generation's captivity. What started then stops now. My struggle won't be their struggle. My pain won't be their pain. My trauma won't be their trigger. And tonight I got one question for you, church family, and it's this. What is your well? What is your well? The well tonight is symbolic of the things that we keep going back to that we know won't satisfy us. It's the things that look good to us but aren't good for us. And I wonder, what's the thing the devil has convinced you is harmless? What's the thing, what's the decision, what's the person, what's the place that could be detrimental to your purpose? Because here's what I've learned. The devil will try to cut you off from God's best by convincing you there's something better. He'll try to get you to be like, hey, it's better your own way. You'll be happier going this direction. But hear me, I don't know about y'all, but sometimes the biggest hindrance for me becoming the person that God has called me to do and the biggest hindrance from the purpose of God being unfolded in my life is not the enemy, it's the inner me. It's the things in my life that I've left unchecked and unprocessed that keep driving me back to this place. Can I say something controversial? <laughs> Not everything's the devil. Sometimes it's dumb decisions. And some of us are so tired of the problems we experience, but we're not tired of our patterns that are producing them. Don't mishear me. There's a very real devil. Don't mishear me. There's a very real battle. Don't mishear me. There's very real demons. But I've often discovered that people will overemphasize spirituality to negate personal responsibility. The devil can't control you, church family. He may influence you, but he can't control you. You control you. You control your choices. You control your decisions. And here's why I'm working so hard to get us to understand this is because your decisions in life shape the direction of your life. And I love this passage of scripture because here, this picture is this woman where we see how repeated decisions can shape someone's life direction. Here is this woman sitting and showing up to this well where she sees Jesus seated at the well. Now, when I was reading this passage of scripture, I couldn't help but think to myself, how did this woman get here? How did this woman get to this place in her life? How did she get to this point in her life? What motivated her to go back to this well every day? And some of y'all may be thinking, John, oh, she was just thirsty. John, if she was just going to get water. See, I'm not just talking about the geo geographical place she's in. I'm talking about the emotional state she's at. Now, it may be wishful thinking to determine exactly why she was in this place emotionally, but I do believe there are pieces of information within this passage that will give us a clear picture of the woman's motivation. You ever read the Bible and you read something and you think to yourself, why is that in there? <laughs> You're like every single day. <laughs> I can't help but be curious that the Bible indicates the time of day that this woman goes to the well to get water. Now, you may not have thought twice about that. Many of us read over that. And we're like, okay, cool, the sixth hour. I don't even know what that means. But we need to understand something, that the Eastern minds understood time. They counted time differently than we do. So our, our Western minds, when we read the sixth hour, we're like, okay, I don't understand that. But the Eastern mindset, the Jew would say that as, okay, it's 12 p.m., it's noon. Now, the reason I think this is interesting is that many Bible scholars believe that the sixth hour was the time of day when no one would go to get water. Because it was the hottest time of day because the, the sun was at the highest point in the sky. 
And it would be so hot, in fact, that people would actually avoid going to the wells to get water because it would make something that was already difficult even more difficult. So imagine with me when the Bible says that this woman comes to this well while the sun is at the highest point in the sky, while everyone waits till the sun is at the lowest point in the sky. This then leads me to assume that the woman went to this well at this time to be unseen by everybody. She went here to avoid being seen by others. She didn't care how much extra time it would take her. She didn't care how much extra work it would take her. The extra work was worth it so she wouldn't have to be seen by anybody. So imagine with me in this moment, okay? Get this. When she shows up to do her regular routine, when she shows up to her regular place, but this time here's Jesus sitting at this well that no other person was sitting at, talking to her about things in her life that no one should ever know about her life. And here these two are, having this conversation about water. A water that will never run out, a water that will never run dry. And the Bible says that she's so curious, she's intrigued, she's excited. She's like, okay, that sounds wonderful. Give me some of this water. Now watch this, watch what Jesus does. Watch how he shifts the flow. Watch how he pivots in the conversation. He says, okay, go, call your husband. I always thought that was a strange pivot. I always thought when I read this that this was a strange transition. Like that's a drastic subject change. Why does he go from water to this woman's husband? Then it hit me. Jesus wasn't just addressing where she goes to get her water. Jesus was addressing where she goes to get her worth. Because remember... Jesus doesn't just go to the surface. He wants to get to the soul issue. He's trying to get her to see that she can't keep doing what she's been doing, that she can't keep going where she's been going. Because remember, he's trying to get deeper with this woman. Because Jesus does not just want behavior modification. He wants soul transformation. When he has your soul, he has your life. He has your heart. He's trying to get her to see that she cannot move forward into all that God has for her in her life if she does not confront the very thing that's been crippling her. And this whole time, this woman, she's just been talking about water, thinking that they're having a conversation about H2O. But it was never about water. It was never about a well. It was about the places and the areas of her life that she went to to find her purpose and significance as a person. And can I just say this? Your significant other will not give you your significance. Your significant other will not give you your significance. Discover your significance in singleness. That way, when you get in a relationship, you won't be asking for something from someone that they were never made to give you. Yeah, and keys, you can come on up as we land the plane tonight. And we see that Jesus... Jesus knew that the well in her life may have been men, but the why was the worth that she found in men. This is the place that this woman would go to get her validation. This is where she would go to feel affirmation. This is the place that she would go for the acceptance in her life. But how many of you guys know when you live your entire life trying to find the acceptance of people, you will be crippled from their rejection? just imagine this woman she's so quickly responding defensively when he says go call your husband she says but Jesus I don't have a husband and I see Jesus looking at this woman with so much grace and compassion I see the eyes of Jesus looking at her with so much mercy she's saying you're right you're right in saying you have no husband for you've had five and the one you're with isn't your husband I think many of us when we read that passage we're like dang come on get her Jesus savage Jesus calling out her sin calling out her issues calling out her bad habits 
there's a strong difference between calling someone out for something and calling something out of someone. Calling someone out for something has the sole purpose to embarrass and belittle them. You're calling out their baggage. You're calling out their issues. You're calling out their problems. But calling something out of someone has the sole purpose to call them to a higher way, a better way, a more godly way, a more righteous way. And Jesus will never call something out of you to condemn you. He will always call something out of you to heal and restore you. Here's Jesus. He's trying to get her to see that the very thing that she keeps going back to will never fill her up. And her response to Jesus is what so many of us do when it comes to addressing our dysfunction. This woman hides her dysfunction with disfle- deflection. She reverts back. So how many you know dysfunction doesn't look like dysfunction to the one who's dysfunctional? Because it's how you've survived. It's all you've ever known, maybe. It's all you're familiar with. But hear me, man of God. Hear me, woman of God. Just because it's familiar to you doesn't always mean it's what God has for you. Just because your dad used to do it that way doesn't mean you have to do it that way. Woman of God, just because your mom did it that way doesn't mean you have to do it that way. Students, just because your friends do it that way doesn't mean you have to do it that way. Hear me. It may look like the perfect way to escape the pain. It may look like the perfect place to escape the hurt. But hear me, it's not a place of protection. It's a place of imprisonment. Whatever you and I use to escape from life will eventually enslave our life. And hear me, when captivity becomes your master, poverty will be your mindset. And so we walk around, we walk into church, we walk around our friends, we walk around our family, we're like, ah, this is just the life I have. This is just the way I am. This is just the cards that I've been dealt. This is just my personality. This is just the way that I was born. Man, it's a good thing that Jesus says you need to be born again to enter the kingdom of God. I wonder if some of us tonight have become so content with our dysfunction that we no longer desire healing. I wonder if some of us are so content with toxic thoughts that we no longer desire to hear truth. We're so used to thinking the way we've been thinking. I can't tell you how many people I've met who would rather stay stuck in the same cycle of destructive sin then step into the uncertainty that Jesus offers them. The uncertainty of freedom, the uncertainty of salvation. Hear me, just because freedom is unfamiliar to you, just because joy is unfamiliar to you, just because something may not be familiar to you doesn't make it too difficult for our God to do in your life. Come on, we serve a God who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly more than we can ask, we can think, we can imagine. Just because it's not familiar doesn't mean God can't do it in your life. This woman, she's probably just trying to find a solution to her pain. She's probably trying to fill the hole in her life. She's trying to find something, someone that will fix it, that will fill it. She's been with six different guys trying to find something that will work, trying to find something that will last. Some form of belonging, some form of security. And here she is having a face-to-face conversation with Jesus, God in the flesh. Unaware everything she's been looking for can be found in this man the seventh man now, I don't know about you guys 
But the number seven, symbolically throughout scripture, is typically tied to completion, perfection, rest, whole. And so Jesus is saying to this woman, I believe Jesus is saying to me and you tonight, you want to go back to that well? You may be thirsty again. You want to go back to that place? You may hate yourself for it. But if you experience my water, if you experience my well, you won't just be filled for a moment. You'll be filled for a lifetime. You won't just be filled with purpose. You'll be filled with power. Power to overcome. Overcome the very thing that you've been overcome by. Have you come in here tonight stuck? Have you come in here tonight bound? Unable to move forward into the person that God has asked and created you to become? What you gonna do? Try harder? Be better? Be stronger? Be more disciplined? Be more devoted? No, you won't. There's no answer within yourself. You can't save you. You can't set yourself free. You're no match for the powers of hell. The powers of sin and temptation. There's only one. And he's the one that did for you what you could not do for yourself. And he came, leaving eternity to step into humanity. He came so you and I could no longer be defined by our sin, but we could be defined by the one who set us free. He came so you and I could be filled. He came so you and I could be free. I'm so tired of traveling around the country and seeing people come into church and leave the same. Jesus was not beaten so you could stay broken. He was not beaten so you could live the rest of your life limping. He was not beaten so you could literally live mundane life. Jesus did not place his spirit in you so you could sit on the couch for the rest of your life. He placed his spirit in you so you could be a part of the movement of his church. And hear me, just when you thought you were too messed up, just when you thought you were too far gone, just when you thought there was no way out, God came for you. Because there's no mountain he won't climb up. There's no wall my God won't kick down. There's no place my God won't go to get to you. And can I just tell you, the gospel is not about your love for God. It's about God's love for you. That he came. When I was at my worst, he gave his best. Coming to Jesus, church family, is not about trying harder. Coming to Jesus is not about doing better. to Jesus is about putting down your efforts, putting down your striving, and simply saying, I trust in Jesus. I trust in his perfection. I trust in his power. He's the only one that can set me free. He's the only one that can get me through this. Hear me. A new marriage will not satisfy you. Popping pills will not take the pain away. Only Jesus can. Only Jesus. Only Jesus can heal your heart. Only Jesus can set you free. Only Jesus can bring you joy. Only Jesus can break you free from the same cycle of sin that you've been stuck in for so long. And I just wonder how many of us in here have found ourselves going back everything that we know isn't good for us. In a moment, I'm going to have us respond, but I want to invite every single one of us to stand to our feet in this moment. I do believe that God tonight doesn't want to just address the well. I believe he wants to address the why. 
I believe that he doesn't want to just do the surface work tonight. I believe that he wants to do the soul work. And hear me. God cannot heal what you and I keep hidden. Now I want to I want to bring clarity to what I mean when I say healing. Healing is not about becoming a better version of yourself. That's not healing. Healing is about letting the worst version of you, the darkest places in your heart, be loved by God. Healing's not about becoming something. Healing is letting God in so the dark, broken areas that we've let run our life. Hear me, man of God. Hear me, woman of God. If you and I are going to do what God has called us to do, and if you and I are going to be who God has called us to be, we cannot keep going back to the wells that are crippling us from becoming who God's called us. And I wonder if there's some people in Cornerstone Church in Austin, Minnesota at 7.37 p.m. that want to encounter Jesus tonight. I'm not going to not going to pull your hand, I'm not going to twist your hand. Because here's the deal. Emotion doesn't move God. Your faith does. So when I'm going to invite you to come forward to this altar, we're going to have a very still moment. So if you want more, if you want to encounter Jesus, if you know that there's a well in your life that you need Jesus to show up at, to shine a light in, I want to invite you forward right now. No one feeling pressed, pressured. But if you're up here, you say, you know what? I want more of Jesus. There's been some things that have been crippling me. I want more of Jesus. Praise God. I love about this text is that Jesus is not in a rush. He's not in a hurry. And, and I've discovered something. We are so good at being familiar with worship, but we are totally foreign with waiting on God. And in this moment, it's almost like Jesus is seated at this well, having a conversation with this woman. And I want to give God some time to do what he does best because here's the here's the truth god can do more in 30 seconds of waiting on him than we could ever do in 30 years of working in our own strength so i want to give god the time and the space to speak to heal so here's what i want us to do maybe everyone in this room together we can just simply put our hands out like this in the posture of receiving see jesus Speak to me. God, would you show me the areas of my life that are crippling the person, the progress that you have for me in my life. God, I don't want to go back to this place anymore. God, I give you the pain. I give you
your presence. It's not by a might, not by power, but by the Spirit of Almighty God. God, I just pray for every person in this room. God, I thank you that you see us at our worst. That the Bible says that while we were still sinners, so we could experience life. You didn't die so we could be enabled to stay in our sin. No, you died so we could be empowered to overcome sin. And I thank you that today, the very thing that we've been overcome by, we've been overwhelmed by, we are leaving overcoming. We are leaving conquering. We are leaving with authority over. So God, we give you the glory. church family we're about to go into another song of worship I'm going to come back up to this next set because I do believe that there's another response for the people in this room following Jesus but come on can we put our hands together can we lift our hands can we maybe do something we've never done before so we can see something we've never seen can we give God some worth can we give God some worship can we tell him how good he is can we thank him for his goodness can we thank him for his grace can we thank him for how he saved you for how he set you free for how he set you apart for a great work for how he has great plans in store for your life come on church let's worship